Status quo. Satisfaction. These things take little work, but we fight for them every day. What if this wasn't what God wanted for us? What if he wanted more? What if he wanted us to get uncomfortable? What if he wanted us to leave the status quo behind? What if he wanted us to never be satisfied? What if he simply wanted us to move? Well, good morning, Catalyst. Uh, how are you guys doing on this awesome rainy day? It's great. Those of you that join us online, I hope you're having better weather than we are. It is a wet, dismal day here in Central Kentucky, but in here, we are alive because we came here today to worship God. Amen. That's exactly why we're here today, and if you came here for any other reason, you're going to be sorely disappointed. So, uh, uh, but we're glad that you guys are here. My name is Dave. Um, I'm one of the pastors here. And we are in, like Rob said, a series called Move. If you guys, if this is your first time, you guys will see there are four chairs up here. Two weeks ago, we talked about chair number one. These are, these are the four chairs that Jesus moved his disciples through, and he calls us to do the same. The first one is the lost, where the major uh, event here is conversion, moving from from loss to save. And this is where Jesus says, just come and see. Come and see what I'm doing. To, and then when you move from the loss to save, you move into the learner chair, chair number two, where the major thing there is transformation, moving from a lost person and behavior and habits to a, a Christian. Um, and this is a, a big time of growth. Or we talked about that last week where Jesus says, follow me. He says, come and see. Then he says, follow me. And today we're talking about chair three, the worker, where Jesus, third invitation is come follow me and I will send you out to win the lost. Okay. That, that's the main thing. So some amazing news has been circulating the last couple years. It's just amazing news. I saw an article about the fastest growing church in the world. Do you know where it is? No, it is not here at 101 North 1st Street in Nicholasville. It is not. I wish it was, but it's not. The, the, the fastest growing church in the world is in the most unlikely place you'd ever think. It is in the country of Iran. It's the fastest growing church. There are more people coming to Christ in the church in Iran than any place on the globe. Isn't that incredible? All right? Uh, conventional wisdom said that a, that a church could never grow there. It's a Muslim country. It's persecuted. All right? Uh, in 1979, when the Shah was deposed, uh, um, <clears throat> Islamic hardliners came in and set up an Islamic government. All right, all missionaries were kicked out, evangelism was outlawed, Bibles were banned, pastors were killed, etc. All right, um, in 1979, there were around 500 Christians of Muslim origin, in other words, 500 converts from Islam to Christ Christianity in the country of Iran. In 1979, there were 500. As of the most recent count, I've seen that now there are at least 700,000. Some would say there are more than a million. Fastest growing church in, um, in, in the world is in Iran. The second is in Afghanistan. Isn't that something? Uh, uh, a couple stories I read. Cameron was, in a, was a, a violent man who used to sell drugs and weapons. One day a friend gave him a New Testament. All right, after reading for five consecutive days, Cameron gave his life to Jesus. This is in Afghanistan. When his family and friends saw his transformed life over the ensuing months, many of them also came to faith. A church now meets in Cameron's home. Then a, a story out of Iran. Reza was a mullah, a Muslim scholar who hoped to become an ayatollah, which is a Shiite leader. One day studying at his Islamic seminary in Iran, he found a New Testament that had been boldly left there in the library by someone. Out of curiosity, he picked it up and was deeply shaken. Over time, he fell in love with Jesus. Today, raised as a trained church planter, serving in the Iran region. All right. A woman named Fatima, earliest memories of being raped by her brothers. At age 11, she was sold into marriage to, to a young drug addict who abused her and then divorced her when she was 17. Upon returning home, she was raped again until she decided to leave. On the street, she heard the gospel being preached. 
and she trusted Jesus. In time, she married a Christian man. They had been receiving training in evangelism and church planting. Fatima felt called to go back home and witness to her family. All right? And her entire family repented, gave their lives to the Lord. The first church Fatima and her husband planted was in her childhood home, the place of her childhood trauma. Praise God. All right? Uh, and, and so the church in Iran is growing at this rate because... Christians in Iran understand what many American Christians don't, all right? The, the, that following Jesus means that we become workers for the kingdom, right? I, I don't see any reference in any of these artists to great preaching or to great music or to great children's ministry or to great youth ministry. I don't see any reference to the location of church buildings or budgets or, or worship style or tax-free status. I simply see references to workers for the kingdom, all right? So Jesus had invited his disciples to come and see, and then he invited them to follow him. And unfortunately, chair two is where most people stop. They just kind of stall out there. All right? The, the, the message of American Christianity seems to be one of get your life right, learn some good things, hear some good sermons, learn how to pray, uh, uh, you know, conquer your sins, and, and this kind of thing, which is all great stuff. That's most of us where, where most of us land, and we stay there for the rest of our lives. That's not what uh, Jesus modeled, not by a long shot, not what the Bible teaches. We're to move to chair three through the discipleship process and become workers for the kingdom. See, a shift happens between chair two and chair three, okay? A shift happens. Remember, we referred, last week we referred to this as kind of the adolescence of, Christian, of the Christian discipleship where you're, kind of, you're still a teenager and everything. Well, you become an adult right here. And what happens is that chair two, which is mainly inwardly focused, chair three, you begin to shift your focus outwards to the needs of others, okay? Um, the, the chair three worker stops asking what's in it for me and instead asks, what is best for the body of Christ? What does the body of Christ need? What does the church need? What does God's kingdom need, need from me, Okay? It's okay to be in chair two. It's okay. Just like it's okay to be a teenager. It's okay. But it's not okay to stay there. Jesus calls us deeper. Okay? All of a sudden, when you move into chair three, your faith is no longer just about you. It's, 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 it's more than just what you're learning, uh, whether or not you like what's going on. Now Jesus opens your eyes to a new and exciting part of the Christian life and discipleship. And he, he invites us to, the, to experience the joy of putting the needs of others in front of our own. All right? We see the point where disciples move from chair 2 to chair 3 in Luke chapter 5. You turn to Luke chapter 5, verse 1 through 11. This is what it says. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, one belonging to Simon, Simon Peter, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught a thing. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. If everyone will just underline your Bible or highlight it, because you say so, okay? That's the, key, that's the key point right here. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. They signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled up their boats on shore, left everything thing and followed him right so there, there are five things about chair three people that where, where we need to get as people we learn from this episode right here where jesus moves them from chair two to chair three the first thing is this is number one they were available everybody say available available okay they were sitting there watching the nets they were close proximity to jesus all right, chair three people have to be in close proximity to Jesus. They, they, in other words, they created the right set of circumstances to, uh, to hear his call and his instructions. So my question, church, is that you today? Have you positioned yourself close enough to Jesus that you can actually hear his call to you? Because a lot of us haven't. A lot of us haven't. A lot of us aren't there right now. Um, we're, we're just not. We're, 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 the problem is, is that everybody's just too busy, right? 
And the, uh, if you ask any American, they'll tell you they're just so busy, they're just so busy. Everybody's just so busy, aren't they? And some of you may be. Most of us aren't. You understand, it, the busy people, people as busy as us, would not have invented the term binge watching. Okay? People that are busy, they, that just don't have a second of time because everybody's so busy, would not invent the term binge watching. Okay, a study came out this week said the average teenager looks at a screen for seven hours and 22 minutes per day. Doesn't sound very busy to me. Oh, busy doing something, not anything significant. If we were as truly as, as, as busy as we say we are, we wouldn't be doing that. How busy would you be? Teenagers and adults. The adults are just the same. That, that, that was just done on teenagers. Adults made probably even worse. How busy would you be if you didn't have a screen to look at? Let's say that the electricity went out and you couldn't get online, didn't have a phone. How busy would you be? I know exactly how busy you'd be. Everybody would be bored. Okay? We're not that busy. How many of you all would have at least, and I mean at least, one hour a day? When you understand that moving to chair three is the natural thing, you guys. It's the natural thing. There's, this is the natural thing. Getting stuck here is the anomaly. There's something wrong if you spend your whole life here. It is the natural thing to move into close proximity to Jesus. Okay? Jesus doesn't care about your ability or your inability as much as he cares about your availability. Okay? So, are you available? Are you available? Chair three workers are people who position themselves close enough to Jesus that they can hear his call. They have available, checked on their calendars. Okay? The second thing that we learn about tier three people is this. They responded to Jesus' instruction. This is like every pastor's dream for people to hear and actually go out and do. It's amazing. It's amazing this happens. He, 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 they, they hear what Jesus says. Jesus says, get in the boat. I'm going to teach the people. So they do that. And he says, put out in the deep water. And then they do it. And then he says, put your nets down for a catch. And, and Peter says, listen, Jesus, I understand that you're the son of God, but you're also a carpenter, and you don't know anything about fishing. I've been fishing these waters since I was a kid. I have already been out here, Jesus. Don't you love it when people try to explain to God what's going on? Don't, don't you love that? I mean, he, he, he is so much like us. You know, I know, I've just been out here. I know all the good spots for fishing. I know there are no fish over there. I know it. But, what did he say? But because you say so. I wouldn't do this for anyone else, Jesus. Because you say so, do it. Amazing. Research done by Willow Creek Community Church in South Barrington, Illinois, showed something that really amazed me. People who are part of a church for more than two years, in other words, they, they've been coming to church for two years or more, all right, had never, that had never made a commitment to Christ in those first two years, most likely never will. Isn't that amazing? You'd think that the longer you're in church, the more likely you are to decide to follow Jesus, No. They found that's not true. They found the exact opposite. The longer you're in church without making a commitment to Christ, the, long, the less likely you are to make a commitment to Christ. Now, why would that be? This is why. Because people get very good at saying no. They get professional level excuse makers. Professional level, no, that's someone else's job. And the more and more you say no to Jesus, the easier it becomes. The more you say yes to Jesus, the easier it becomes. See, practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. And we are what we continually do. And so if you are continually saying no to Jesus, that's what you become. You become someone that says no to Jesus. And if you say yes to Jesus, that's what you become. You become someone who, who says yes to Jesus. We are what we repeatedly do. Okay? So let's just stop and take inventory right now. Have you become really good at saying no? Have you become really good at saying, you know, Jesus, that's just somebody else's job. Nah, I don't think we're going to do that. Have you tried to explain a way to Jesus why he, he's telling you to go over there and there's nothing over there? Have you become real good at that? Well, look what, hap look what happens if, if, if we become spiritual deadbeats. 
what do we miss out on? What if Peter had said, you know what, Jesus, I've been fishing all night. I'm kind of tired. I think I'm just going to go to the house. What if he had said, you know, okay, you know, I, I know there aren't any. My nets are breaking. I just want to go to the house. Jesus, there's nobody. There's, there's no fish over there. I'm just not going to do it. I'm just going to go. What would have happened? The answer, nothing. And that's what so many Christians simply experience. Nothing. Instead, by being obedient, what did he do? He took in a huge catch of fish. He was blessed beyond imagine. See, what people in chair three understand, what people in chair three understand, that people in chair two haven't learned yet, is that blessing follows obedience. See, you have to be obedient to Christ. How many times did Peter have to be obedient to Christ before he was blessed? Three times. Okay, at any point if he had stopped, he wouldn't have gotten blessed. He wouldn't have been blessed. And so many Christians are missing out on the greatest blessings in life they will ever, ever receive simply because they've gotten good at saying no when Jesus calls. You guys, what I found being a Christian for 21 years is that the commands of Jesus aren't hard. Aren't hard. They're really not. Jesus said to get in the boat. Peter could do that. I've uh, said, put out in the deep water. Yeah, you can do that. That's, that's not hard. So put down your nets for a test. Catch. That's what Peter did every day of his life. He was a fisherman. He just wasn't telling him to do anything hard, was he? In the same way, most of Jesus' commands aren't hard. They're not. I said most, not all. Some are difficult, but most aren't. It's not hard to serve in children's ministry. It's really not. It's not hard to serve in youth ministry. It's not hard to pray for the lost. It's not hard to commit to being in church every Sunday. That's not hard, y'all. We, 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 make, we make it it's so big and, and, oh, I can't believe I have to get up at 1030. <laughs> it's not hard. And people that tell me the hard, that's hard, man, how in the world do you live? How in the world do you survive? How do you do the hard stuff in, in, in life? Seriously. It's not hard to go on a mission trip. It's really not. People say, well, I, I, hard to go on a mission. No, it's not. You do more planning for a vacation than you do for a mission trip. And you do that every year. It's not hard to do that. It's really not. The question is, are you going to say yes or no? Most of Jesus' commands aren't hard to do. And share three people are people who respond. They're people who engage with Jesus in his mission. Okay? The second, the third thing we find out about share three people is this. They're enthusiastic about what Jesus is doing. I love this. Don't you love being around people that are enthusiastic about what they're doing? I, I love it. It's contagious. All right. When they, when when they had been blessed, when when they taken taken in this huge thing after their steps of obedience, and they got this huge blessing that was about to sink the ship, what do they do? They're like, "Oh man, we better keep this to ourselves." No, there they they singled the other boat. Say, "Come on, come over here, participate in this huge blessing with us. Come over here, look what God's doing over here. Get over here." All right? That's what chair three people do. They find out what Jesus is doing, where Jesus is working, they invite everybody to come on over and have a party. That's what chair, people, chair three people are good at. They're really good at it. So, so is there any excitement within you about what the Lord is doing? Do you guys realize what an anomaly just sitting here is? Do you all understand this? Do you understand what our church has been through this past year? Do you understand what God is doing in this church right now? Do you get it? you all online? Do you all understand what's going on? We have experienced the largest year of growth in our church history in 13 years. 13 years of, of, of <laughs> attempting to be faithful, saying yes to Jesus. This church has grown more in a pandemic year than any other year. It's amazing. And we can only credit God because it certain ain't anything I'm doing. Okay, I'm still preaching the same sermons. We got the same worship team. We got the same, you know, uh, we got the same chaos. We do. It's only the Lord doing that, y'all. Only the Lord doing that. And I want everyone to be a part of it. I just want everyone to be a part of it. I want to see people walk in here discouraged and leave encouraged. I want to see people lost that walk in here and experience Jesus and experience healing. And I want their marriages to be healed like they're being healed right now. I want, pe I want families put back together. I want people saved, moved from lost to saved. That's what I want to see here. And man, I'm inviting everybody to be part of it because that's what's going on, y'all. 
That's what it is. People are enthusiastic about what's going on. If you're not enthusiastic about what Jesus is doing, you're not going to be much of a worker because no one is really going to want, to want, want, want a piece of what you've got going on. Now, I can imagine how many, how many people, apparently Sunday afternoon at, at, uh, at restaurants, it's like the worst time to work as a, as a waitress or a waiter because apparently people there are just dull and glum and they don't tip and they're rude and everything like that. Well, man. Aren't you supposed to be, didn't you just have an encounter with Jesus at church? Man, what in the world is wrong with you? I imagine people say, well, if, that, if, if what you've got is Jesus, well, I don't want any part of that. Okay? People are enthusiastic. So are you enthusiastic about what God is doing? Well, it certainly did for the disciples. You know, they were only saw God's blessing after they were obedient, though. And I think a lot of people... That, are, that call themselves Christians, that are dull and glum and have no joy and no love, they've just become really good at saying no to Jesus because they've, nev they've never experienced his blessing. Okay? You know, I just think, what if Peter had said no and just gone home and started complaining about life, right, when a huge blessing was there right for his taking had he said yes? I wonder how many of us do the same thing. How many of us just go home Complain about work, complain about life. God has left me out to dry. Don't see any blessing from God. Well, maybe you need to be obedient. Maybe you need to say yes to Jesus. Because blessing follows obedience, not the other way around. Okay? So you guys, people who are enthusiastic about what God is doing, usually those who are obedient first. They actually do what God says to do, and they're the ones that obtain the blessing of God. The fourth one is this, we find out in this, that they're sensitive to conviction, okay? Chair three people are sensitive to the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. When, when the Holy Spirit tells you you're doing something wrong, when your conscience grabs you, man, it destroys these people. It really does. When Simon Peter saw all this, and saw the blessing, he fell at Jesus' feet and said, go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Now, what in the world is going on here? Didn't he just obey Jesus three times? What, what in the world is he talking about? This, this guy went against his judgment and everything, and he obeyed Jesus and was blessed. Why in the world was his reaction, go away from me, I'm a sinful man? I don't know. I wish I was there because I'd like to shake him by the shoulder and say, what are you talking about? Like maybe this. Maybe he was so bothered by the fact that he even questioned. Because he'd seen the miracles of Jesus so much. And he, maybe he just was so broken that his bad attitude had it made him even question for a second. You guys, we have to be sensitive to conviction. See, the people, what I've found, I've spent a lot of my life in the church. And I've known people that are immature Christians. And I've known people that are very, 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 very dedicated and very devout. You want to know the difference between the, 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 the thing that I've noticed is people get more devout and closer to Christ? You know what I notice? They are more broken over their sin. The closer you get to Jesus, the more you realize your shortcomings. The more you realize your inadequacies. The more you realize how amazing God's grace is. That, you know, things that, things that when, you were a, a, when, when you were very, very immature in your walk with Christ, things that just didn't bother you at all. Maybe your mouth, maybe some things you watched, maybe some saying no to the Holy Spirit, maybe some things you didn't really even notice. But man, when you grow closer to Christ, these things destroy you. That's what happens in chair three. The closer you are to Christ, the more sensitive you are to conviction. You guys... That's, they're very, very open to Jesus' correction and conviction. It's the only way we grow close to the, to, to the Lord. See, guys, we live in a culture that wants to avoid correction. We live, we live in a culture that, that anyone who dares point out to us that we're not doing things the right way, they're judging me. Can't believe how judgmental those people are over there. Right? Hmm. Well, you know you move from chair two. To chair three, when all of a sudden your sins start to bar bother you a little bit more than they used to. They really do. Right? You'll be grieved over the fact. You'll wake up and realize that all your prayers throughout the week have been about you. That didn't used to bother you. 
You know, it does. You'll be grieved over part of your personality. You all of a sudden realize it's destroying your witness for Christ. You'll be bothered by the fact you went off on a coworker yesterday, and they know you're a Christian. It didn't used to bother you at all. That's just the business world. No, it starts to bother you now. I mean, that's how you know you're in close fellowship with God. You're acutely more aware of things that other people just simply accept as part of the deal. And the fifth thing we learn about share three peoples this, that they were sacrificial. They were sacrificial. Look at what they do when Jesus calls them. And Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll fish for people. So they pulled up their boats on shore, left everything, and followed him. Wow. You realize what they walked away from, you guys? They walked away from their professions, from their source of income to follow Jesus. They, le- they walked away from everything. They l- simply left them there. They didn't even sell them on eBay. They didn't sell their nets or their boats or anything like that. They just left them there because they were so utterly valueless compared to the call of Jesus. They left everything. In other words, Jesus' invitation to make disciples was att- more attractive to them than anything they currently had going on. You guys, share, share three people I found are willing to make major life changes. Major life changes. I've seen chair three people, not just a tweak here and there. I've seen, I've seen chair three people do this. They use vacation time to go do missions. Wait a minute, that, that's my time. That's my time. I've worked hard for that vacation time. Well, yeah, they sacrifice that and they go on mission trips. They'll move to a different neighborhood to lower mortgage costs so they can give more. I've seen people do that. They'll, they'll, they'll tell a coach they won't be there on Sunday mornings for games so they won't miss worship. They'll change jobs. They'll take a pay cut in order to get the work of the Lord done. I remember one time we did respite care for a foster parent my wife worked with. I'll take that back. My wife did the respite care. I I, I made sure I was gone most of the morning and early afternoon. But I'm telling you, even having that little baby in the house for a few hours, crying, the attention he needed, I'm telling you, he'd been out of infant mode for a while, that, that's like a shock to the system. And he was the cutest little baby you'd ever seen until he started crying. We just had him for a few hours on Saturday. Here, three people would disrupt their entire lives to bring a baby like that into their home. Not just for an afternoon, I'm talking permanently. If you don't think that's sacrificial, do some respite care for a foster parent. You'll find out real quickly what how much they sacrifice. Jesus said, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll fish for people. So why did Jesus tell them not to be afraid? Well, because they were leaving everything. And that's scary to a lot of people. And Jesus said, don't be afraid. I got something better for you. The chair of three people are sacrificial. So in order for us, so those five things happen in, in this chair right here. Okay, they're, 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 they're sensitive to correction, they're, they're in close proximity with Jesus, they're obedient, they're enthusiastic, they're sacrificial, okay? But in order for the worker to really do his best work or her best work, there are three things that have to happen. The first thing is this, you have to find your personal ministry, okay? Your personal ministry. What, what, what I found what was really very, very, I don't know, kind of frustrating for me as a young man in the church when I was in college. We went to a church and I was 19, 20, 21 years old, and I've always been passionate about ministry, always have been. But the church, because I was a young man, 19, 20, 21, said, well, we have one job for you. You go work with the teenagers. You just go over there and babysit the kids. Well, I love youth ministry, but I wanted to do more. I wanted to, there was an evangelism committee. I don't know what we did. I don't know what they did, but there was an, I wanted to be on that. No, no, that, that's, you go work with the kids. I, I wanted to preach. No, 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 you know, that, that's, that's, for the, that's for the head guy. You go work with the teenagers. And that's not, I, I was in youth ministry for nine years. I love working with teenagers, but I was assigned a role that wasn't necessarily for me. And it seemed like that was the path that all young people got put in. Well, when you're a certain age, you go work with the children. And when you get a little bit older, you go work with the, the, the youth. And when you become a real adult, that's when we can really use you in something good like ushering. Nothing wrong with ushers. Some of my best friends are ushers. But the thing is this. 
No one ever asked me, what are you passionate about? What makes your heart beat faster? What keeps you up at night? What do you dream about? What bothers you so much that if it continues, you'll just die? No one ever asked me that. And guys, that right there, understanding that, is the key to understanding your personal ministry, what God put you on this planet to do. Okay? Every one of us, I believe, has a passion like that. Someone said your calling is where your passion meets a worldwide need. That's what you were here for. All right, in Luke 10, 1 through 2, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him into every town and place where he was about to go. He sends his disciples out on a short-term mission trip, first short-term mission trip in the Bible, right? He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Our goal here at Catalyst is to get every one of you all into where you are passionate and have a personal ministry. Right? That may be part of what we're doing here. It may not be. You may be passionate about worship. You know that, that every up, everyone up here is a volunteer. You know that, right? It's their personal ministry. All right? We want people to serve here in the church, our children's youth ministries, our ushers, greeters, worship team, etc., prayer team. We always need people. But that's not the limit. Okay? That's not the limit. We want you to get alone in your prayer closet. And ask God, where do you need, you, you craft me, you made me with my passions and my abilities. Where can I work so that your kingdom is grown? Someone said, like I said, your personal ministry is where your passion meets a need in the world. See, some people are passionate about raising children. The Lord calls them to foster care, adoption, work in children's ministry. That's awesome. Some people are passionate about prison ministry. Some people are passionate about hiking up mountains to build wells for people. Uh, without clean water. Some people are passionate about praying for the lost. Some people are passionate about leading people in worship. Some people are passionate about preaching or church planning or providing food for the hungry. Whatever it is, that is your personal ministry. The harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. And we expect that out of every person here at Catalyst. I'm passionate about a lot of things, but it wasn't until this week, you guys, that I really found out what I'm passionate about. Isn't that amazing? I've been talking about this for 21 years, and I just discovered, I just, it just hit me, what I actually am passionate about when it comes to ministry. This is it. I'm passionate about going to the hardest places I can find to bring the gospel there. The easy road doesn't interest me. It just doesn't. That's why, instead of going and being senior minister of another church, I wanted to start one, because it's hard. It's hard to do. That's why... I can't wait to get over there, back into the jail, and start reaching fathers. Because that's a hard place. The darkest place in Jessamine County. That's why God sent me to Asia to get teamwork started there. That's why I love prison ministry. That's why I love seeing recovering addicts come in here, because they have the toughest time. I'm a pastor of this church, and I love it. I really do. But I have a personal ministry that's unique just to me. And I realized that this week. It doesn't make any sense to people, and that's okay. Your personal ministry doesn't have to make sense to people. It really doesn't. Probably most of what Jesus did didn't make sense to his disciples either. It only needs to make sense to you. And I love going to the hardest places I can find. That's where all the results are, y'all. That's where all the results are, in the hard places. That's where I love to see God work the most. And that's where power of God is seen the clearest. The hard places, the dark places, the places where no one wants to go because it's tough and because it's dangerous and because it might cost you. That's what gets my heart beating. So many people in the body of Christ have never gone to a dark place, never been to a hard place in their lives. Uh, and so many have missed out on the joy, the ecstasy of seeing the Holy Spirit move in ways that he only moves in those places. And we have to discover that's my personal ministry. That's my calling. And I'm not looking down on anyone else that doesn't feel that. Like I said, it doesn't have to make sense to you. Just have, it, it, my, my calling doesn't have to make sense to you. It only has to make sense to me. And your calling doesn't have to make sense to me. It just has to make sense to you. Your calling, your personal ministry is where your passion meets a worldwide need. That's it. So the second thing that the worker must do 
after finding your personal ministry, you got to prioritize. Okay, you got to prioritize. 1 Timothy 5.8 says this. Anyone who doesn't provide for their relatives, especially for their own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Like, whoa, whoa hang, hang on, Dave. You just said that you just got us all fired up about going out. What, what are you talking about here? Hang on. You're a parent. Your children are your first disciples. Never forget that. I know this is a very sensitive subject, and I get that. I really do. Parents have, still have children in the home. God has given you people in your home to disciple. He's hand-delivered you your first disciples. Okay? And if we don't prioritize them, we're going to be no good anywhere else. Okay? See, parents, what I've found out as a parent, I've been a parent for almost 22 years now. What I've found is that we're, teach, we're good at teaching them to do well in school. I mean, we, 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 we ground them if they don't make good grades, right? Take away privileges if they don't. If, if they don't get good grades, if they're slacking off, if, you know, I can't tell you how many lectures I've heard that I've passed on to my kids. You know, like that commercial, we can't stop you from becoming your parents. Well, yes, I've become my parents. I'm literally telling my kids the same thing my parents told me, okay? We're good at teaching them to do well in school. We're good at teaching them to do well in sports. We're good at t getting them to clean their rooms. We ask them all the time, what do you, be when, what do you want to be when you grow up? But are we good at showing them what it means to be a disciple of Jesus? You understand that's the only thing that's going to matter in a hundred years. Jesus said, what does it profit someone to gain the world yet lose their soul? Good question. Are we better at teaching our children to gain the world? Or are we better at teaching our children to nurture their souls? Good question, parents. Parents who have grown children, you're still a parent. Disciple your grown children. They'll listen, believe me, they will. Anyone who doesn't provide for their relatives, especially their own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Discipleship starts in our homes. We have to start getting it done in our homes. Maybe God is calling you to move from chair two to chair three, and your, the work he has for you is in your own home. Maybe that's where he wants you to start. I have pretty good authority that it does. That's where he wants you to start. Okay? Let's get it done in our own homes. Maybe the harvest is plentiful in your own home, but the workers in your home are few. Okay, we have to prioritize. We have to win ourselves first. We have to get discipleship done in our homes, and then and only then are we ready to go reach the world. Okay, and the third thing that I found about the worker is this. You'll experience both setbacks and victories. Let me tell you something. If you decide to move into chair three, which I hope you do, you're not going to win everybody you preach to. You're going to experience failures. I wish I could stand up here and tell you that I have presented the gospel so clearly to people that peep at every person I've presented the gospel to is now uh, doing missions in Iran. Nope. I've invested years and years and years in people just to see them deny the faith and walk away. I've had more failures and I've had successes in 21 years, believe me. Astronomically more failures and successes. And if you're a worker, you will too. And you have to realize that that's okay. Because guess who else experienced more failures than victories? Jesus himself. He was not able to reach the world in his lifetime. He wasn't. Matter of fact, he only made about 12 converts and one of them betrayed him. And he made 11 disciples that he set loose to change the world. There were people that, walk, that heard the gospel preached from the Son of God and walked away from him. And they will walk away from you too. Just remember that. That's part of it. And it's okay. Right? Luke 10, 8 through 12. Jesus says this. When you enter a town and are welcome, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter town and are not welcomed... Go into the streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than, on, than for that town. And then verse 16 and 17, whoever listens to you, listen to this, whoever listens to you, listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. Jesus is saying this, whoever, uh, uh, whoever rejects me, rejects him who sent me. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Listen. If you present the gospel, if you, if you share your faith with someone and they reject you, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting the Son of God. 
And their problem is with Jesus and not with you. So just go do it. Don't beat your head against the wall for people that reject God. Don't do it. Who are they rejecting? They're rejecting God, not you. Move on to people who are receptive. Life is just too short. There are plenty. Far too many Christians get discouraged when they keep, can't reach one person. And they quit. Don't. You'll experience both setbacks and victories. Expect setbacks and victories. Okay? We're supposed to do what? We're supposed to pray that the Lord will send workers into his worker field. In his, his field. I'm going to invite the band to come on back up. I remember the first time I entered a prison to do prison ministry. I'd never been to jail before. I know that surprises some of you. Especially a lot of you that grew, grew up with me. But I was matched up with a mentor. A black pastor named Michael Jackson. I kid you not. And really... The guy could moonwalk. He was awesome. But we walked through seven locked doors into the Fayette County Detention Center. We entered a group cell. All right? There were 14 guys in orange and me and Michael Jackson. We had barely gotten introductions done when alarms started going off and the cell doors automatically slammed shut. We found out later that there had been a fight in another pod. And the jail was on lockdown until they cleared it. See, what I found out uh, was that a lot of times fights and are, are, are used as distractions for someone to do something else, a drug deal or, or, or something. So they, even if there's a fight in one place, they lock the whole, prison, the whole jail down and they clear everything, make sure everybody's there, make sure, you know, all this kind of stuff. And that takes a while. So it was me, Mike, and, and 14 inmates dressed in orange staring at us. And this was my first time. We wound up being there four hours. Four hours. I was in this jail, okay, with these guys. Apparently fights are, like I said, start as a cover. They made sure all the inmates were accounted for, all materials were accounted for. And I think, quite honestly, they lock everyone down there just as a deterrent. Listen, if you, if you start a fight or anything, we're going to lock you down for longer than you need to be locked down just as, as a deterrent for future ones. You know what happened, though? I got to talk four hours with men that needed Jesus. They got four hours with two pastors. Don't tell me that was a coincidence. God cleared my schedule for the day, y'all. Mike and I, like I said, we heard, we heard stories about each man. We prayed for every single one of them individually. Heard about their kids and their fears about their kids turning out like them. Four hours. As one, of the men, one, as one of the men was talking, I clearly heard the voice of God say to me, the harvest is plentiful. Workers are few. God sent Mike and I there specifically that day, specifically for those men, and he cleared our schedules. See, God doesn't necessarily need your ability or your inability. He needs your availability. He'll clear your schedule, believe me, he will. He'll do it by locking you in a jail. He'll do it by sending you to a mission trip where, where, where you don't have access to your phone. He'll clear your schedule if you're available. You see, guys, it's in those moments right there. Not only do you do kingdom work, but I'm telling you, this is when you move from listening to other people's stories to creating the stories of your own. When you, you, I look back on that right now, and guys, that's a part of my eternity, that scary time, my first time in jail where I got locked down. That's a great story to have. And your most, the most risky things that you do for the kingdom, the work you do for the kingdom, will become your greatest stories and the most satisfying things you will ever experience in life. What I'm scared of, what I'm scared of, is that so many of us will come to the end of our lives and we will have no stories to tell. We'll talk about, oh, the car we got. What do you do? We'll talk about binge watching a TV show. Great, what a great life. Or we could talk about the time we were so scared 
that God sent us into something we had no business doing and we had no talent for and no nothing for, and yet he worked in tremendous ways and we're basking in the glow of it 10 years later. Guys, obedience doesn't follow blessing. Blessing follows obedience. So if you have gotten very good at saying no to Jesus, I want to ask, I, I pray the Holy Spirit hit you with the two by four today. Holy Spirit, not someone here. Don't hit, someone, don't hit someone with the two by four. I pray the Holy Spirit hits you with the two by four and wakes you up. And I pray that if you are in chair two and you've grown and you're ready to move to chair three, ready to become a worker, you're ready to go out and start, start winning the lost and winning people, making disciples, I pray that God will send you out to the place where he has for you. As we finish up today, understand that this is the natural progression. This isn't for the ordained guys. This is for everyone. And Jesus may be tugging at you, moving into chair three. What I, the, the thing that, I, that gets frustrating right here is that instead of moving here, a lot of times people work for a while and they just kind of say, I put in my time. I'm moving back to chair two. It's somebody else's job now. I, I, I put in my time. I put in my time. I've done enough work. Now I'm just going to sit here. Somebody else's job now. I'm done. And if that's you today, I pray that God will send you a huge conviction for that. And that you will get back in the race. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, you have told us that the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. Oh, Lord, how serious and how true that is. During this past year, Lord, I've seen more people hungry for you than I have in, uh, other than the 46 years of my life. I have never seen people more hungry for you than right now. The harvest is so plentiful. and The workers are so few. Heavenly Father, I pray, like you said, to, that you would send workers into harvest field. Lord, grow up workers out of this church online and in person. And Lord, send us out into the harvest field. Lord, we don't have a lot of ability. We sure have a lot of availability. Lord, show us what you want us to do. Thank you, Lord, for the joy that you've given me whenever I've said yes to you. Pray everybody in here would experience that as well. We love you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray.